say that time passed fast is a gross understatement, is it not? One way you can measure that is by uh, watching the young people. Also, um, it's been six years since Ty and Michelle Furlow sitting over here had their anniversary. Today is their six-year anniversary, and it just seems like it was just the other day. The family of two now is a family of five. They have Adeline, Shay Lee, and Noah. So uh, you might want to congratulate them on their six years of marriage. Also, we have a teenage teenage event coming up on October the 17th. You might mark that on your calendar. October the 17th, from 7 to 8, um, West Houston Bible Church, as well as uh, some other uh, churches and synagogues, are hosting stand-up pro-Israel teen event. And it will be in Houston at Beth Yeshurun um, at Beth Yeshurun um, Synagogue, I guess it is, and you'll get more information between now and then. But anyway, those are the things that are coming up. Also, you'll remember, hopefully, that there's going to be no Bible class, no young people's class this week, because I'm going to be out of town. There's going to be no uh, Friday night fun night. Just some, I've already been told that's a bummer. But... We will be here again next Sunday, Lord willing, and we'll continue the Star Series. Let's prepare ourselves now for the study of God's Word. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, the option of naming privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, thank you for providing for all of our needs. Now we focus on your mighty word. And we see what a great and awesome God you are. We pray that you will open our minds so that we can see the big picture. And have an appropriate appreciation for who and what you are. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to continue this morning with the star series. We've already gone over a few items. The fact that God has a message in the stars for us. And there's very few people, there's even few believers that realize that. And yet it's in the scripture and it's in the stars. First thing we pointed out that this, this ministry... And this series has nothing to do with the uh, pseudo-counterfeit of astrology. That's God's, uh, a counterfeit of God's message in the stars. And nothing that we are learning has anything to do with astrology. It does have something to do with astronomy. And really what astronomy is doing is just finding out the wonders of God that... Um, the more we advance in technology, the bigger the telescopes we, we have, the more we find that is out there. And probably we still just are barely scratching the surface at this point. We wanted to, everyone to recognize that God's message in the stars is not with letters, it's not with an a alphabet or language, it's with pictures. There are images in the stars uh, that the constellations form that give a message to us and has, I believe, ever since Adam. I believe that God taught Adam his message in the stars and then they have passed it down uh, from that time on. We have to get a little uh, basic astronomy to understand how this all works. And we were talking about two things last time, I hope you remember. One was called the ecliptic, and the other was called the zodiac. Just in case you don't remember, I'm going to show you what those are. George, if you will kill all the lights. I believe you all can still make notes, can you? Even with the lights out. 
it really helps when the uh, lights are off to be able to uh, see on the screen better. So we're going to start out looking at how, how this works. I hope. There you go. Thank you, Danny. I was waiting on y'all, and I, Danny was. <laughs> okay, thank you, Danny. We don't have to sit and look at a black screen for an hour. Okay, this is the sun, which is a star, average size star. And the earth makes a rotation around the sun once a year, 365 days. And as it travels around the sun, it goes through these different constellations. Now, the 12 constellations that fall on the ecliptic, which I'll show you in a moment, is called the zodiac. These are the 12 signs of the zodiac. In Greek, that means the circle. And so as, we, as Earth makes its trick through here, we, see, we go into the different, different constellations. When it's over here in front of Leo, then we can see that constellation. Now, to us, it looks, it looks differently. But again, here's another way of looking at it. Here's the Earth making its trek across the orbit or around the sun. And you see this dotted line? That dotted line is what appears to us as the sun moving around us. It looks like the sun and all of these constellations are moving around us and we are uh, stable. We're in one point. That's what it appears to us. But we know that that's not what's happening. Sun goes, uh, the, excuse me, the earth goes around the sun and here are the planets. Now, this is a good shot of what it appears to us. Here's the earth. And we're, we're stable. And it appears like these constellations are moving around us. That's what it appears. And so, right now, if you look into the southwestern part of the sky, you're going to see, let's see, you can still see Scorpio to a degree because the, the earth would be in this area right here around the sun. And you can see some of Sagittarius and a little bit of Taurus. But as we continue to go around the sun, excuse me, it, it, I'll just say the way that it appears to us. As these are moving around, it will be out of this area and going around here. And these different constellations will come into view. The reason they're coming into view is because we're going around the sun, but it appears that the sun is actually, the sun and the planets are going around us. Are you thoroughly confused yet? Because I can do better. Not better explaining, but at confusing. All right, this is, this is a phenomenal uh, picture. And you look at it, you think, wow, what is that? Those are the 12 constellations that fall on, this is what is called the ecliptic. This is the apparent trek of the sun around the earth, even though it doesn't go that way. That's the way it appears to us. And in that invisible line that goes across, all the constellations that fall on that line are called the zodiac, the 12 signs of the zodiac. We start over here with Virgo. Then we have Libra. We have Scorpio. Sagittarius, a Capricorn, and then we have, um, this is Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, and Leo. That's the 12 constellations that fall on that invisible arc around the sky. Well, what are all these others? These other constellations are called deacons, spelled D-E-C-A-N-S. And they are the constellations that fall within six or eight degrees of this ecliptic in here. And they are part of the story. 
These twelve, sun, these twelve signs of the zodiac and their deacons, which are all these other constellations that fall within a certain band of the ecliptic, that is invisible line that goes around uh, the earth, these tell the story. God's message in the stars are found in these 48 constellations. Now you can look in other places in the sky and there are a lot more constellations, but they don't fall in this ecliptic here, so they have to be in that area in order to be part of God's message in the stars. Now here's the ecliptic. If you were standing on earth like this guy is, he's looking at the great square of Pegasus, but this shows the ecliptic. It's just an invisible arc that goes around the earth, and it is in that arc that the sun, the moon, the planets, Everything moves around in that arc. If you're looking over in this area to find the, the sun, the moon, or the planets, you won't find it. They're all in that arc around the earth. Here's a way of looking at it. The ecliptic comes kind of like an arc. In the summer, this ecliptic, this arc, is way up overhead, nearly straight overhead in the summer. But as the earth continues around the sun, and because the earth is tilted on its axis, it causes the ecliptic, this arc, to go from way up here to down to here. It gets lower in the winter. Now, remind you, you can't see this arc, but in that invisible arc is the place where the planets and the sun and the moon and comets and so forth are. That's what it kind of looks like if you were on the evening sky. Here you have Saturn, you have Regulus the star, you have the moon, and you have Mercury over here. See how they all fall within that same band right there. That's the ecliptic. Let's see if I have anything else. Okay. Now, I want to ask you a question. Are you all ready for a question? It will seem easy. You like easy questions? Okay. Where are we located? Right now, well, you're Texas. Well, I'm going to get closer than that. Whoop. Let me get off here for a moment. I forgot to. Did you all see that? Did I give it away? Talk on it. I need to hire an aide just to go up here and do this for me. I might have blown it, and I spent a lot of time getting this ready for you. Okay, where are we and what is our location? What street are we on? William B. Travis Lane, right? Okay. What city? Brenham. Well, we're really not in the city of Brenham, but that's our mailing address, so we'll say we're in Brenham. What county? Right. These are the easy ones. It gets harder. What state? Texas. <laughs> what country? United States. Okay, now, do you go further than that? I mean, what would be next? Continent? North America. Is that as far as we go? Planet. We could go to North, uh, do, split up the hemispheres. What planet are we on? Earth. That's as far as we go, right? No? What's next? The what? Solar system. Somebody said it. And that's the sun. We're around the solar system of the sun. I guess that's as far as we can get, right? No? Y'all saw it, didn't you? Y'all, some of you saw it. <laughs> what galaxy? Milky Way. Now, when you get past that, I don't really think it makes any difference. Because there's some debate whether there's more than one universe. I guess we could say we're in God's universe. That's pretty general. 
That is actually where we are located right now if you want to get a very detailed description. So, um, what we want to do now is... I'm not sure. Let's see what the next slide is. <laughs> okay. There is the Milky Way galaxy. And... Here's our location in it, right along in here. We're between some of the outward bands of the Milky Way galaxy. Here's another shot of it, and I think this is a nice shot. We're somewhere right along in here in the Milky Way galaxy. You see the bands of stars. It looks kind of, kind of like a pinwheel. And when you get into the middle, it kind of looks like a fried egg or something. It just looks like it's solid. It's not solid, but there are so many stars there that the light from the stars just blend in as if it's just one big solid light. This is made up of billions of stars. And you think, okay, ho-hum, that's nice. Well, what we're going to see now is the size of... We're going to start out with the a size of the planets around the Earth, I think, or do I have a solar system left? Let's see. No, that's right. I'm going to show you the solar system first. These are the eight planets. Now, I know out here at Pluto, they called a planet for a while, but now they're saying, uh, some, a lot of people, a lot of scientists are saying it's not really a planet, so they're calling it eight planets, and then you have this Pluto as well. So we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And there's the sun. This is the order of the planets of the solar system. Now, what we're going to see now is the planets according, ranked according to their size. The littlest one is Pluto. Then you have Mercury. Then you have Mars. Then you have Venus and you have Earth. So you see Venus is about the size of Earth right now. And I don't know if you've noticed in the far western part of the sky, pretty low in the uh, off the horizon, looks like a really bright star. Have y'all recognized the, recognized that lately? Y'all don't even y'all never look at the sky. You can't look in the sky without noticing this really bright star. Only it's not a star. It's Venus. It's the planet. Uh, some people think that you can't even see planets with the naked eye, but Venus is very very um, very bright, and we'll see Jupiter is bright as well. You can also even see Mars, and uh, you can see another... I haven't gotten into the, to the uh, stars yet, but uh, you can also see Saturn. So, this is, this is the size of the planets, the small ones. Now we're going to look at some of the bigger planets, and the smaller planets will be there, but you'll see how vast the difference between the size of the planets. Here's Pluto. And this is Mercury. Uh, this is Mars. And this is Venus. And here's Earth. This is what we just saw, the smaller ones. This is the size of Neptune. You see how much bigger it is than Earth. And Uranus is about the same size. And then look at Saturn. Uh, you, by the way, you can, uh, you can see Saturn with, the, uh, with their naked eye. Uh, it looks like a star. But if you put a telescope on it, even I have a telescope that you can see the rings around Saturn. It's really neat. And then you have big boy here, Jupiter. Now, I want you to notice this. Jupiter has bands around it here. And I can see Jupiter, I can see four of its stars. It has 63, uh, excuse me, four of its moons. It has 63 moons. I can see four of them on my telescope. Can't hardly resolve. This is the great, right, uh, great red dot on Jupiter. Some think it's a, a huge storm. You can take Earth and just put in that one red spot in Jupiter. That's how big Jupiter is. Now let's look at the sun and look at the sun compared to the planets. 
This is Pluto. You can't hardly see it. Here's the other smaller planets. Here's Earth. And then you have, uh, what is this, Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn, and Jupiter. And here's the sun. Maybe you didn't know that the sun was that much bigger, but here's some more facts. The sun is an average-sized star, and like all stars, it emits its own light. Here's the earth compared to the sun. The sun is so large that it would take over 100,000 earths placed side by side just to span the diameter of the sun. Now think about that for a moment. 100,000 earths Going across the diameter, that's not 100,000, by the way, but it's just the only way I could show to show how big the sun is, which is, a, is an average-sized star. Four million tons of the sun's matter is changed into, in, in, uh, into energy every second. Four million tons of its matter is changed into energy every second second. I'd say it has to be pretty big or it wouldn't be there long. Here's the earth. Again, here's the planets over here. Now here is the actual order of planets with their, the other we were ranking them as size. The closest is Mercury, then Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and then Pluto's out here somewhere. So that's the order of them. The sun is 600 times larger than all of the planets put together, including their moons. So if you put all the planets together plus their moons, the sun would still be 600 times larger. You could fit 1 million Earths inside the sun. Are y'all getting blown away yet? We have hardly started. How about the size of the stars? The other stars compared to the sun. Here's the sun. And I don't know if you can see. Can you see this? Let's see if I hold this up. You see that little spot right there? That's not Earth. That's Jupiter. You can't even see Earth at this scale. So this is Jupiter, this is the Sun, this is Sirius, which is, or Sirius, which is a, a white dwarf. Yeah, a dwarf, and look how much bigger it is than the Sun. This is Pollux and Arcturus. Look at the size of Arcturus next to the Sun. Now we're getting bigger. Here's the Sun. You can't see it, can you? It's one pixel big. That means it's like a little pin dot there. Here's Sirius, Pollux, Octurus. These are the ones that we just saw. Now, look, this, this is Rigel, Aldebaran. This is Betelgeuse. Uh, Betelgeuse, remember we looked at, uh, I think the first, the first lesson was in the shoulder of Orion. And here is Antares. I'm going to give you some facts on this one. It's just unbelievable. By the way, you can see Antares tonight if you know how to, how to look for it. It's in the constellation Scorpio. It's actually the heart of Scorpio, and it's red. It's, you can tell that it's red. It's a red giant. Remember Scorpio that looks like the lazy ass laying on the... It's right above the horizon. This giant here, the diameter of... Antares is 300 times larger than that of the sun and 39 million times the diameter of the earth. That star is so big that if you started putting the earth right here on this side and putting it side by side, it would take 39 million to cross all the way to here. We're not talking about circumference. We're talking about diameter. Now, if that doesn't blow you away, I don't know what will. That's, that is a tremendous sized star.
Let's look at the uh, the size of Beetlejuice. Remember Beetlejuice? Here is the outside uh, outside circle of Beetlejuice. Here's the sun. This is how far the earth is from the sun, 93 million miles. And from here to here is just the radius of Beetlejuice. And that's not as big as Antares. In other words, you would have to go way around like this to get Betelgeuse in there as compared to the sun. Actually, the sun there is larger in this scale, but I had to make it big enough so that you could see it. The number of stars. Anybody know how many stars there is? Anybody want to guess? That's right. It's good that you don't because Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 22 says, As the host of heaven cannot be counted and the sand of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David my servant. So the Lord is telling us you can't count the stars. God not only counted them, He created them, and He has named them. And when you, when, you get a, when you get a handle on how many there are, you know that only God could do that. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 37 says, Thus says the Lord, If the heavens above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. He will do that if the heavens above can be measured. Is there a chance of that? There is no chance, and so there's no chance that he's going to discard Israel. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25 through 26. To whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number, he calls them all by name. Listen to that, all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Now, there's so many stars that we don't, there's no number. I don't know if there's enough zeros in order to, to number the stars. And yet, God has not lost one of them. He's named every one of them. And he has them move in the order in which he designed. There are so many stars in space that the night sky could not show the solid, uh, excuse me, could not uh, show the solid stars from the horizon to horizon. In other words, there's so many stars that if you could see them all, it would look like day because it would be solid light, no space in between, even though there's vast distances between them. The fact that we can see mostly in the dark sky uh, shows the immense effect of all the dust and gas in space. So in between the stars, that's where we're going to go next. I'm going to describe the distance between the stars. You've kind of got an idea of the size of the stars. Some of them are, are itty-bitsy stars which are bigger than the Earth. And then you've got some stars like uh, Antares, 39 million uh, Earths to go across. It. So... Let's get into the number of the stars. I don't know if I have a PowerPoint on this. Let's see. Yeah, I do. Look at that. You know what you're looking at? Well, this is just a shot at random out into the sky. And all of this light-colored and dark-coloredness you see here is called a nebula. And nebulas are made out of dust and gas. And when this was taken by the Hubble telescope, and when you get out far enough to see it, it lights up. And some of these nebula look like images. One of them that I can see with my telescope, and I got so excited when I saw it, is the smoke ring nebula. It's up close to M31, and when you get your telescope on it, it looks like a big smoke ring, like a perfect smoke ring. Not circled like this, you know how, Earth, how it's kind of like an oval when it, as it goes up? 
and you have the Eskimo nebula. It looks like an Eskimo with a parka around its head, you know, the top part. And you have the probably the most famous is the Horsehead Nebula, which is in Orion. Anyway, those are that's what you're looking at there. Now this is called a star cluster, technically a global cluster of stars. Sometimes stars will group together and form a, a cluster of stars. And this is a, what's called a global cluster because it's somewhat round. Now if you get closer to it, it looks more like that. Anybody want to count those? Here's a, a global, another one that is a little bit further away. See, some people don't know that there are, there are global clusters. There's double, uh, double stars. There are uh, the nebulas. There's so many things in the sky that you can't see with the naked eye. But that's a, a global cluster there. Now that is just a shot in an area of the sky where there's more abundance of stars. Now I want you to put this in perspective. If you put your fingers and your and your put your middle finger and your thumbs together where they touch like that. Go ahead and do it. And look at that. You see the little space that makes? If you take that and look up to the sky and you put it on this part, that's what that's showing. That's how much of the sky those, that many stars are showing in that amount of space. And just think of all the way around the globe how many stars there are. There's, I don't know how many are there, but there's there's over 100. <laughs> are you getting a little wowed by the number of stars there are? All right, now we're going to look at the distance of stars. If you're not impressed with the size and you're not impressed with the um, different, uh, the what were we looking at? The number of stars, thank you. Now, here's the distance of stars. The distance of cellular space is measured in time rather than miles. And we do that sometimes. If someone came in and asked you, um, how far is it from Brenham to Austin? You might say, oh, it's an hour and a half. What did we do? We gave them distance in time rather than miles. And that's what's done in space. In 1995, a Concorde jet broke the world record when it flew around the world 22,858 miles in 31 hours and 27 minutes. Now, I, I'm, they've probably done something, they've got something that goes faster than that, but in 1995, that was the record. One trek around the earth, 20, which, which was 22,858 miles in 31 hours and 27 minutes. Light travels six times that length in one second. It travels at 186,000 miles per second. Give you an idea what that's like. If a ball was shot from a cannon moving at the rate of 500 miles an hour, how long would it take it to reach the nearest star to us? Anybody got a guess? What do you say? A long time. <laughs> Listen again. If you shot a ball out of a cannon going 500 miles an hour, how long would it take it going at 500 miles an hour around the clock to make it to our first star? 13 million years. And that's to the closest star, which is Proxima Centauri. The nearest star to us is the sun, which is 93 million miles away. How far is it to the next star nearest to us? Um, and in other words, from us to the nearest star, if you compared the distance from us to the sun is 93 million times. How many more times 
would you multiply that 93 million miles to get to the nearest star? Nearest star. You want to guess on that one? 300,000 times. 300,000 times 93 million is how far. And that's the closest star to us. And you saw how many stars there are. If we could shrink the sun down to the size of a ping pong ball and the earth the size of a grain of salt, if the sun was the size of a ping pong ball and the earth was a grain of salt 13 feet away, that's about from, from me to Kate, no, that's, that's more, um, what's about from me to Pete, what is that, about 13 feet you reckon? 13 feet. How far away would Sirius, or Sirius, excuse me, which is 8.8 .8 light years away, how many miles would that be on that scale? 1,400 miles. Here you have the Earth as a ping pong ball, oh, excuse me, the Sun as a ping pong ball, where Pete is sitting, a grain of sand is the Earth. On that scale, you would have to go. 1,400 miles to get to the first star. Anybody know how wide our galaxy is, the Milky Way galaxy? Caleb knows. 100,000 light years wide. So if you, that means if you took, you, you started at the, point of one side of our Milky Way galaxy and you were traveling 186,000 miles per second, it would take you 100,000 years to get across just that one galaxy. One of our closest galaxies to us is the Andromeda galaxy that is considered to be in our neighborhood. Do you know how far it is away from, from our galaxy? You're, I know y'all are afraid to guess now, right? <laughs> Two million light years away. So if you left the Milky Way galaxy, which is our home, and you were going to the closest galaxy in our neighborhood, you would have to travel two million years, traveling 186,000 miles an hour in order to make it there. And here's one of my favorite pictures here. Oh. Isn't that beautiful? This is our home. This is the Milky Way galaxy. This is the Andromeda galaxy. Not very far on this little scale here. This is, what did I say it was? It was 2 million light years to get from this galaxy to this galaxy, and it is the closest of our galaxies. There are, you'll see that there are billions and billions of galaxies. And yet, these are, to us, this is the closest one. You can't see galaxies with the naked eye, by the way, except you can see the Andromeda galaxy if you know where to look, and where would you look to find the Andromeda galaxy? Come on. In the constellation of Andromeda. That's how you find things in the universe is by the constellations. So if you look in at, uh, the constellation of Andromeda, you would see a very, very little faint, little, you can't even... You can't even reconcile it down to a, to a shape. But it looks like a little fuzzy spot. And you can see it with your naked eye. If you have good eyes on a clear night, no light pollution, and you look at Andromeda and you're looking very closely, if you have 20-20 vision, you can find a little fuzzy spot, and that is Andromeda. It's the only one that I'm aware of, the only galaxy that we can see. And Andromeda, you can't see here because it's not to scale, it's so far away, is nearly twice the size of the Milky Way galaxy. I just love that picture. I think that's a beautiful shot there. I think I'll leave it up there for a moment.
Now, our sun moves around the Milky Way at a rate of about 40, 43,200 miles an hour. That's the, how fast the sun is moving in its orbit around the sun. You know how long it would take to make one complete revolution? It takes 365 days for the earth to go around the sun. How long does it take the sun? Because, see, these galaxies are spinning. To make one revolution, anybody have an idea how long it would take? No takers? 18 million years. 18 million years to make one revolution in the sky. There are billions and billions and billions of galaxies. I think it's safe to say that God has created a universe that leaves us speechless. Does he not? Psalm chapter 8, verse 3 through 4 says, When I considered your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? Isn't what? Just think of our God. That he created all of this out of what? Nothing. And yet he is still mindful of us? This is the Hubble telescope that is a, this is a deep field object. You would not see this in the, with the naked eye. Infrared view of countless entire galaxies. You see all these things? See these that are flat looking? See them all in here? Can you all see, see, see those from there? Those are all galaxies and this is just in this one little spot in the sky. If we zero in on this part right here. See that galaxy right there? That's what it looks like there. And you can see all these other galaxies that you couldn't see in that first shot. The more that man is able to get more technology to see more, the more there is there to see. And we th you think that this is it? There's still more. This is a very famous picture. What? <laughs> very famous picture. It's called the small blue dot. Do you see it? Right there. See that? You know what that is? That's Earth. They just happened to catch it in a band of light as the Voyager is on its path four billion miles away. This small faint dot is a picture of the Earth taken from Voyager 1 at a distance of four billion miles away. It was launched on September the 5th, 1977, and it is traveling at a speed of 38,000 miles per hour and it, had, it entered interstellar space on August the 25th, 2013. Well, that was, what, about a month ago. Now, inter, interstellar space means that, you know, our solar system, this is the first, of course, this is the first time ever anything that man has made has gotten outside of our solar system and now is in interstellar space traveling at 38,000 miles per hour, left in 1977 from Earth, and is just now getting to the edge of our solar system. The solar system is just the planets that go around, that circle the Earth. The, the Earth. But that is, doesn't that make you feel small? Now that's just getting to the edge of our solar system. You would have to go another... Uh, Four trillion, uh, yeah, four trillion miles to get to our first, our nearest star. Now, I was thinking about this. You might find this interesting as well. I, I like to just uh, meditate on these things and I come up with some ideas. 
light traveling at the speed of 186,000 miles per second equals about a trillion miles. One trillion miles, okay? Now I start thinking, okay, um, if we are, if we, let me make sure I have that right. I'm not really good in math, but I think this is uh, this is true. What I'm about to tell you. If light travels 186,000 miles per second, it travels about uh, one trillion miles in a year. Think of our deficit for a moment. If we were spending 186,000 dollars per second I think it would take about five and a half seconds to spend a, a million dollars and then you in one year's time spending a million dollars every about five and a half seconds you would get to one trillion dollars and we have a deficit of 17 trillion dollars does that kind of put it in perspective as well Maybe we ought to start, well, I hope we don't start, but if we don't stop this, we'll probably have to start calculating our spending in light dollars. Maybe, I don't know. Okay. Um, I think I have the direction of stars next. Yeah, oh, the difference in stars. Well... The difference in stars uh, also has to do with the direction that they're traveling. You know that all the, the stars appear to us like they are constant in the sky. They don't move. Now, we can see the planets and the moon, moon and the sun move because they're right there close to us. But the stars are fixed in place. But even it, it appears like that to us, but in, in actuality, they're, they're traveling at different directions at tremendous speeds. For instance, Octaurus, remember we saw Octaurus in the size of the stars, the big red giant, is within our galaxy. It's not that far away. It's still in our galaxy. And it's moving at a speed of 270,000 miles per hour. And yet it would take 50,000 years for it to move from our vantage point a quarter of an inch in the sky. You want me to say that again? Our Taurus is in our const is on our uh, galaxy. It's moving 270,000 miles per hour. It would take 50,000 years of traveling at 270,000 miles an hour for us to be able to tell that it moved maybe a quarter of an inch in our from our perspective. That again kind of gives you some information about the distance. Now here's a question. How can light get to us from stars which are millions of light years away if the earth is less than 8,000 years old? Are you all understanding what I'm saying? I'm going to give you four assumptions. Now, again, this is the question. If the light from stars take millions and in some cases billions of, of years to get to planet Earth, why don't we look up in the sky and see nothing but darkness? Because the light hadn't got here yet. You understand the question? Here are some assumptions. And, and by the way, that's why some people say that to, to, to prove evolution and debunk creation, they say that, it, well, if, if, if it was so... Uh, if, if we know that this is how fast light travels and we know how far away these stars are, the Earth has to be older than, let's say, 8,000 years old because if it wasn't there, we wouldn't see the stars. You all understand? Okay, that, that's making some assumptions. First assumption is that the vast distance assigned to the stars are real. The stars could have been much closer when they were first created so that their light could get to Earth much sooner. In other words, 
we're just assuming that everything is constant the way it is now. He's saying, somebody is saying, making this assumption, that maybe when the, uh, the universe was created, the stars started out closer to the earth and, and, and able to get their light to us, and now they've expanded, gone further away. Assumption number two. We know for certain how light travels in, in deep space. Or, um, that's the assumption that we know for certain how light travels in deep space. To insist on this would seem rather presumptuous. We don't really know how light travels millions of light years from us, do we? Third assumption. Light has always traveled at the same speed throughout the history of the universe. We don't know that either. We have no way of knowing whether light has slowed down or speeded up so that's an assumption that you have to make to come to the conclusion that you can debunk creationism. And here's the fourth assumption. The universe could not have been created fully functioning with people on earth seeing stars with light already arriving from the beginning. That's the assumption. But this assumes that God is not a God of infinite power. And so in the most presumptuous of all ideas is... Uh, Biblical creation, by definition, is a miracle. In other words, saying that the light couldn't be on earth when God first created the stars is denying his infinite power and the fact that it was a miracle to begin with. Biblical creation, by definition, is a miracle using processes which are not now in operation. God is not dependent on the physical laws which we observe in the present since he instituted these himself. To say that God could not have created a universe which was both large and very young is thus challenging the very nature of God as revealed in his word and not just challenging the fact of recent creation revealed therein. That was kind of long, but it's saying that God created all of this in a miraculous form and to take all of the... Uh, properties that exist now and try to apply it to that. We don't even know what they were. And then the fifth, all this was, these assumptions uh, were made by scientists. This last assumption was made by me. That the earth is less than, uh, is at least 8,000 years old. In other words, that's an assumption. There's a lot of people that think you have to prove evolution by keeping the earth around the 8,000-year-old mark as far as age. But that is an assumption as well. I don't want to go deeper into that right now, but that is, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a fact. I have more. <laughs> well, I think I'll just show you these couple. These next slides are really pretty, so I guess I'll show you those. But I'm... Almost, well, I am out of time, but I'll show you a few of the different things, differences in stars. Isn't that beautiful? This is what it looks like uh, with the right lens to see the different colors of the stars. When you look up into the sky, if you look closely, even with the naked eye on a clear night, you can see some stars are, are bright and shiny white, some are reddish in color, some are yellow. And boy, summer blue. My favorite colored star is Vega. It's in the uh, constellation of um, the scales. What is that called? Um, Libra? No, no, no. Um, it's not. It's not the scales. Anyway, it's such a. It looks like a, a, what are the ring? A sapphire with kind of a topaz color. It's a beautiful star. So. Um, Some stars are much brighter than others. Some that are not very bright from our perspective actually are much brighter than our sun. It is the tremendous distance from us and their temperature that makes the, uh, the well, the temperature helps make them brighter, but it's the distance that makes them harder to see. There's a star in the constellation of uh, Cygnus the Swan, which is in the, the Zodiac, so we'll be looking at it closer. And the star is Deneb. And Deneb is 60,000 times brighter than the sun. 
Have you ever tried to look right at the sun? Well, Deneb is 60,000 times brighter than the sun. And the color is determined by the temperature, size, and distance of the stars. The density, some stars have a density lighter than air. They're just gas, big balls of gas, kind of like some people you might know. Uh, like white, some of them are like white dwarfs, listen to this, that are unbelievably dense. Their density is so great that one teaspoon full of their material would weigh several tons. That's how dense they are. They would make lead look like cotton candy. Oop, I don't want to show you that yet. Oh, okay. All right. Turn on the lights for me, George. We're talking about the differences of stars. Now, I'm bringing this to a close because we're out of time. But this will give you some idea of what the, the, the difference that we can tell, that, not that we're guessing at. Astronomers can tell you what constellation a star is in, the size of the star, if it is increasing or decreasing in size, how far it is from Earth, what direction it is traveling, how fast it is moving, its temperature, if it's getting hotter or colder, what it is made out of, what its density is, if it's a double star or a variable star, what color it is, how bright it is, and if it's in a galaxy or if it's in a nebula, or in its complete history. And when you look up at a star, what do you see? A little white dot. It's amazing what they are. I have volumes of star books at home that are this thick and just on one star they might have 50 pages on one star just describing it giving its history and all the information about it and all the it, it's amazing I hope you have a better appreciation now of what God's universe is about it might make you very small and make you seem very small indeed you don't have to go very Four billion miles, which is nowhere in space, little bitty space, and that Earth is just a little dot. Probably we just have to go another more, one more billion miles than it would be. You couldn't see it all together. And yet God is focused on that little blue dot and the ocean of stars and galaxies and planets out there. But more importantly, He is focused on you. You mean, you mean more to him than all of the stars and planets put together. What a God that we have. I'd like you all please to bow your heads. I'm going to close this service offering the gospel to people who have, may have not heard it. The great news is that you do matter to God so much that Jesus Christ, his son, went to the cross to die for your sins. And he was buried and resurrected and now he offers eternal life to anyone who will trust Him and Him alone for it. In a moment of time, you can receive the gift of salvation through simply believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and His atonement on the cross. And in that moment, you're born again. Your ticket to heaven is guaranteed. And what a trip that will be. Maybe someday He will take us personally throughout the universe to show us even more great and wonderful wonders. Now, Father, we're so thankful that You allowed us to go through this very brief and rudimentary little presentation this morning. But we pray that it will help us have a greater appreciation for who and what you are. And if you can do all of this, certainly you can handle our little petty problems. So we thank you for this and pray that you will help us to focus and meditate on who you are. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.